Hello everyone, no life Brian here. Um Welcome back to Tsumi Horoboshi again for the very last time. You still got the uh tips to read through and the little bonus section I believe is around here. Yeah, the staff room. So we can go through like all the chapter set. Wow, there is a lot. That is pretty wild. And there is some tips. I believe this is the very last tip right here. Yeah, the demon script. So let's read that. After that, I will go and move to the staff room, at, aka the bonus part. So let's uh, let's go then. The seventeenth year of the Heisei era, early summer, AD two thousand five. The car began to rattle as the road turned from asphalt to gravel. The cry of the cicada seeped through the tightly shut windows. Most people would open their car windows and let the natural air in along with the sounds of the cicadas. But people are also spoiled. He'd rather keep himself cool with the air conditioning turned to max than listen to the sounds of nature. Usually it was the rainy season at this time of the year. But this June, the summer had already come up without any rain. Just like how the weather was on that day, 20 years ago. The air around this area is just as clear as I remember it. Yeah, the winds are cool and the sunshine is bright. This place could have become a world heritage site like the village in Gifu. Gifu, what a waste. But thanks to that, there are no irritating tourists around here. See, that makes it much better. Why do tourists... Why do tourists forget about pedestrian traffic laws when they're in rural areas? They walk in the middle of the road, you know. <laughs> Akasaka Senpai, do you still do stuff outdoors? Not as much as I used to. My job doesn't give me much free time. <laughs> Same here. Oh hey. There he is. The other man noticed and waved his hand before anyone in the car could honk the horn. The man was a young fellow on a motorcycle with a big backpack on his shoulders. He looked like he was ready to go camping. Akasaka and his partners stepped out of the car and shook hands with the young man. Captain, it's good to see you again. Yo, how have you been doing lately? Well, I hope. You can take it easy today. This is Akasaka Senpai. He took care of me back in college. Hello, my name is Akasaka. Oishi was supposed to come today, but he had to go for a medical checkup at the last minute. Anyway, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's an honor, sir. So, Akasaka Senpai, where shall we go first? His name was Mamoru Akasaka. He was a veteran detective from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. Akasaka? Where have I heard this name before? Do, 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 do. Uh, let me see here. I could have sworn he, uh, the, the name Akasaka was from like the freaking fourth chapter or something. Hmm. On the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department, despite the fact that he was close to his retirement, he hadn't lost his clear instant and sharp eyes at all. Those eyes showed the confidence he built through many risky experiences, and he had a well-built muscular body and a fearless aura. He must have fought against many violent criminals. His connection to Hanamizawa went back almost 30 years, all the way to 1978. He was in the Public Safety Division in the Metropolitan Police Department. He came to Hanamizawa to investigate the kidnapping case of the grandson of Inugai, the then Minister of Construction. There he met Oishi and Rika Farud. Oh, well, what do you know? Do, do, do. This, if I do uh... Rika Peru predicted her own death. Hmm. Yeah, Himatsu Subushi. That's the the fourth chapter that I already did a read through of. 
Let's see. Anyway, there he met Oishi and Rika Farood. Rika Farood predicted her own death. Hakasaka regretted for the rest of his life that he couldn't save that little girl from her fate. He saw the news of the great Hinamizawa disaster on TV and met up again with Oishi. They pledged to uncover the mystery of both the cruel fate that fell upon the little girl and the series of mysterious deaths in Hinamizawa. Unfortunately, Hinamizawa was sealed off for a long time. As a result, all Akasaka and Oishi could do for the past 20 years was publish the little information they gathered and ask for their readers to send their tips and clues. But recently, the seal on Hinamizawa had finally been lifted. However, they couldn't come to Hinamizawa until today due to Akasaka's busy work schedule and Oishi's poor health. In fact, Oishi was supposed to come with Akasaka, but he was called in for an emergency health checkup. The other two who came along were Akasaka's juniors from university. One worked at the ground SDF and the other was a subordinate. They were assigned the mission of sealing off Hinamizawa, so they were quite knowledgeable about the village. Akasaka took out a scrapbook from his bag. The corners of the scrapbook were all dented, making it look very old. Akasaka flipped through the pages, thought for a second, and let them know his first destination. Alright, please take me to Onikafuchi's swamp. No problem. Right this way, sir. The young man got on his bike and waited for the others to get back to their car. They honked at each other to signal that they were ready, and the young man led the car to the swamp. Heading through the forest, they came to an open area where the ground was covered by concrete. There wasn't even a single drop of water in sight. All the water of the swamp had been replaced by concrete. That was what Onikafuchi's swamp looked like now. <laughs> there isn't even a single drop of water, let alone a swamp. I was told that they sealed the swamp right after the disaster. This place was already encased in concrete by the time I arrived here for my mission. Let's go down there and take a closer look. Akasaka got out of the car and walked to the center of the concrete-filled swamp. It wasn't a parking lot or a heliport. It was just a huge empty concrete space right in the middle of the forest. So this is the place people say was a landing spot for UFOs. Really? I never heard of that. Well, that's what they write on occult websites. They say that this is the place where our government met with aliens. I can't blame them for such rumors, though, because an empty concrete space in the middle of a forest sure does look weird. <laughs> Volcanic gas erupted from the swamp in June 1983. The deadly mixture of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide engulfed and destroyed Hinamizawa in a single night. The village was sealed off and the SDF covered the swamp with concrete. But the people who write those rumors on the internet actually have a point. Any geologist could tell you that covering a source of volcanic gas with concrete is absolutely useless. Hmm, that's true. I never heard of anyone trying to prevent a volcano from erupting by pouring concrete into his crater. On the other hand, our country is known for wasteful construction using the taxpayers' money. Lately, people who love things like supernatural phenomena and UFOs write on the internet about the Great Hinamizawa Disaster. It's well known by now that the cause of the disaster was an eruption of deadly volcanic gas from a magma chamber. In, 18, in 1986, a similar natural disaster occurred at Lake Neos, Neos in Cameroon, Africa. So people easily believed that such a rare natural disaster could occur anywhere on Earth, and that was what happened in Hanamazawa as well. However, a rumor about another possible explanation had begun to fly around on the internet recently. They say that the disaster was a cover-up by the government, and that it was actually a biochemical terrorist attack by aliens. Oh shit. Why had such a rumor begin, but begun to spread now? They claim to back up the theory of the secret document known as File Number 34. Someone online named it File Number 34 for descriptive purposes but the name spread and st stuck since then because it sounded like a government conspiracy. People loved it. It's unknown how or from where they obtained those documents, but they posted scans and pictures, which were all ridiculous. 
Plus, more fake evidence was produced over time, so now even the existence of such documents are in doubt. File number 34 deserves a bit more explanation. However, since it started on the internet, truths and lies were all mixed together and has become more like an urban legend, so this is what it is believed to mostly be true. File number 34 was a notebook written by a nurse named Mio Takano who worked at the local clinic in Hanamizawa. File number 34 was most likely named after her. This woman was a researcher who studied the demon myth of Hinamizawa and tried to solve what it meant. The contents of this notebook state that she prophesied the Great Hinami Disaster of 1983. According to her research, a UFO's crash landed in Hinamizawa a long time ago and sunk into Onikafuchi Swamp. The UFO carried parasitic bacteria from space and they began to infect the locals. Wait, is that all of this shit true? The aliens fucking crashed in Hanamizawa village and went <laughs> landed into the swamp? <laughs> okay, why did we went up to like chapter 6 and all of a sudden there's aliens? How the hell is this all predicted, man? The infected villagers began to behave extremely violently, so much that they were fit for the word demon. Mio Takano insisted that this was the explanation for the myth about demons pouring out of the swamp. An alien who crashed a, the, an alien who survived the crash realized that the earthlings had gone crazy because of the bacteria he brought in, and he decided to show himself to the villagers to help them out. Excuse me. To help them out? This is how oyashiro sama was born. The alien was able to cure the villagers with highly advanced technology, but couldn't eradicate the bacteria completely. Since the villagers looked up to the alien as some sort of deity, the alien, the alien utilized his status to hand down specific rules to the villagers in order to stabilize the disease. The bacteria took a liking to Hinamizawa's habitat, so when a carrier of the disease left Hinamizawa, their symptoms would re-emerge, re-emerge. Therefore, the alien made it a rule not to leave the village. This leads to the legend of the transcendence of Unikafuchi. The weird practices and miracles that the villagers performed were realized by means of the advanced technology that they received from the alien. Okay, hold on. I need to get a drink, so I'll be right back. And I have returned. Alright, let's continue. <laughs> Those maniacs do indeed have a colorful perspective on things, don't they? Do you remember Nostradamus' prophecies? Nostradamus' prophecies? People said that the world was going to end in 1999, but nothing happened in July and people acted like they didn't even know about it. Those TV shows made people as scared as they could be and then ignored the fact that it didn't happen. End in 1999. You know, fun. Fa you know, it's funny because I remember I had a friend told me about that like last week while I was at work. I wouldn't say friend, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if it was like someone told me about this while I was at work, or like a friend of mine online said told me about that. But by the way, those TV shows made people as scared as they could be, and they ignored the fact that it didn't happen. But Mio Takano did predict the Great Hanamizawa disaster. It's not a lie. Look at this page in his scrapbook. You must be joking. <laughs> Akasaka Senpai, is this for real? As time passed, the bacteria stabilized in human bodies and became harmless. The alien and the bacteria began to fade away from people's minds. However, the alien has lived on for hundreds of years with the protection of the three families. It still lives on as the spirit of the diet of a deity in the secret temple of the Farud Shrine. The alien manipulated the bacteria living inside of the villagers and maintained control over them for hundreds of years. The alien wanted to regain his power and started researching how to bring back the lost powers of the bacteria, etc., etc. Things get much danger. Things get much stranger from there. People say that the disaster was actually part of the alien's plan to conquer the entire earth by spreading the awakened bacteria. The Japanese government has a secret division 
that fights against alien invasions. And they trained at Area 51 in the U.S., etc. Et wait, wait, what? The f <laughs> what the shit? Area 51. Oh my god. What the shit? I can't even tell if this is some sort of... I can't even tell if it's some, some kind of weird localization. Or some, some... Or they just put it there because, hey, pop culture is some stupid bullshit like that. <laughs> and they moved in to stop the invasion by sealing off the entire village. And they killed all of the residents by using toxic gas. <laughs> hey, there's a movie that's just like that. Some black guy is the lead character. What was the title? Am I something? Yeah, I know. It's too crazy to be real. But the writer of this bunch of bull, Mio Takano, was mysteriously murdered in June 1983. Right before her death, she gave the scrapbook to a girl as if she knew she was going to die very soon. That girl is known as Girl A. Some guy who investigated the case was able to track it down to a girl named Reina Ryugu. So now it's known as the Reina Ryugu theory on the internet. Reina Ryugu inherited Mio Takano's will by means of the scrapbooks. She tried to fight against the planned invasion by holding a school hostage and demanding this local police uncover the alien's plot. Of course, no one believed her and they assumed she was in a state of paranoia. Back then, people assumed that Reina Ryugu took Mia Takano's delusions seriously and was motivated to commit a poorly executed crime. When she held the school hostage, Reina Ryugu told local police that the alien was controlling the three families and that it was plotting bioterrorism on a massive scale. And the very next day, the great Hinamiz, the great Hinamizawa disaster occurred. You've got to be kidding! Couldn't it be just a coincidence? I don't know. According to police, according to people who believe it's not just a coincidence, there are many inconsistencies in the SDF's immediate sealing off operation. Filling this swamp with concrete is one example. Several of the SDF soldiers on duty at the time testified that some people were conducting secret investigations outside the usual geological survey before the area was closed off. Of course, those who think it's just a coincidence say that the researchers simply took precautionary measures precautionary measures to keep unauthorized people out of the area. I'd have to agree with the latter people. People also question why they sealed off the village for such a long time. After its volcanic gas eruption, Miyaki Island was only sealed off for four to five years. What happened in Hanamizawa was an exceptionally rare natural disaster yet it was sealed for over 20 years. I heard that the residents of Miyaki Island returned to their home island faster than was originally intended because they had requested it so strongly. But in the case of Hinamizawa, there were no residents alive who wished to return in the first place, who returned in the first place. Perhaps the government took their time until they were absolutely certain that it was safe. Hmm. How about this one? The SDF members who were on the mission to seal off Hanamizawa had their blood samples taken periodically. Some of them were discharged from the mission without any explanation after the results came, came back. Some believed that they were using the members of the SDF as human test subjects to see if they got infected or not. I think they were just checking up on the members' health condition since they were in the area where the gas disaster occurred. Besides, normal businessmen also take annual physical checkups, and they have their blood samples taken, taken there as well. Yeah, I understand your point too, but I have another interesting theory. There are some people who believe that there was no gas emitted during the so-called Great Hinamizawa disaster. No volcanic gas? What does that mean? Basically, what they're saying is that there was no volcanic gas, and it was a sort of government cover-up. It's like in the Spielberg movie, you know, the one where humans make contact with UFOs. See, that's exactly how maniacs always explain things. 
What kind of basis do they have to say that there was no volcanic gas emission? Well, a bunch of those maniacs came to uh, a bunch of those <laughs> maniacs came to Nanazawa as soon as the seal was lifted. According to them, the hydrogen sulfide in the volcanic gas should have caused some corrosion to metallic objects and major damage to the to the wildlife. However, they found no such signs of disruption, which led them to claim that there was no volcanic gas to begin with. But this village was abandoned for 20 years. I doubt that they could find anything anyway. <laughs> well, that's the thing with the internet. You can't believe everything you read on it. Well, he's right. Akasaki-senpai, please don't tell me you're buying these stories. At first I didn't, but lately I'm beginning to think that there might be some truth to them. You believe in UFOs? Oh, come on. Well, what if this scrapbook is the real file number 34? Huh? This scrapbook is the one that Reina Ryuku possessed when she took the school hostage on June 25th, 1983. It was assumed to be lost during the confusion of disaster, but Oishi-san's old friend was able to locate it in an evidence storage at the prefectural police headquarters. Back then, Oishi thought Reina Ryugu was delusional, but after reading this again after the great Hinamizawa disaster, some of the contents seem to hold vital clues. It's not the alien part that he was interested in, but her theory that an endemic disease of parasitic microbes, microbes in Hinamizawa was responsible for the curse of Yashiro-sama. Of course, there's no proof that such microbes existed, so it still remains at a theoretical level. Oishi-san says that the three families might have been researching how to bring back the original, deadlier microbe in order to revive the religious devotion the villagers used to have. The Great Hinamizawa disaster could be an experiment that went wrong. This theory is also based on the theories and myths he found on the internet. The village clinic's chief doctor died mysteriously right before the Great Hinamizawa disaster. A girl, Rika Farud, was brutally murdered on the night Reina Ryugu took the school hostage. What? What? Brutally murdered by who? Took the school hostage. There could have been an underground research lab beneath the village clinic. And Dr. Irie could have been forced to do microbiological research, but he couldn't live with his own sins and commit suicide. Rika Frude could have been brutally murdered in a sacrifice for some sort of ritual ceremony in the name of Yashiro Sama's revival. However, their experiment went wrong. Instead of the microbes being parasitic in the villagers, they became a killer virus, and they exterminated the entire village in one night. It's obvious that it wasn't a simple gas disaster. We cannot ignore the fact that one girl predicted a bioterrorist attack right before the disaster, and that several villagers died mysteriously, including Mio Takano herself, who wrote about all that in the scrapbook. It doesn't sound right to say that the Great Hinamizawa disaster was an unpredicted and coincidental natural disaster. When you read this file number 34, it's obvious. So you saying that the Great Hinamizawa disaster wasn't a rare natural disaster, but that it was in fact an act of bioterrorism by some cultists? In the modern era, everyone in Japan knows about the shocking incident where a doomsday cult created a nerve gas, sarin, and unleashed it for the purposes of mass murder. But in the 80s, the idea, the idea of a single cult being able to carry out such an act of terrorism didn't even cross our minds. Some also whispered that the SDF kept the area sealed for so long so they could study some lethal virus, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> At least this story sounds more convincing than the one with aliens and UFOs. The idea of cultists and domestic terrorism sounds more rational. Maybe there really was an UFO that crash landed. When Reina Ryugu took the school hostage, one of her demands to the police was to have them pull out the wreckage of the UFO from the Yonikofuchi swamp. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it is pretty ridiculous. Well, even if I wanted to make sure if it's ridiculous or not, look at it. 
The swamp is filled with concrete several meters thick, and there's no way we can check. This is all because of that ridiculous construction that doesn't even do anything to prevent the volcanic gas. Well then, the only way to prove Akasaka's senpai theory would be to find a survivor of Hinamizawa and try to find that microbe in, in him or her. Sadly, that's almost impossible. After the great Hinamizawa disaster, some survivors were subject to a witch hunt. So even if there are any survivors, they won't tell you that they're from this area. Right after the disaster, some people who were aware of something I was out started displaying erratic behavior. When they started dying mysteriously and committing suicide in strange ways, people got scared of them and chased them out of their neighborhoods. The government was practically useless in protecting their privacy at the time. So the former residents of Hinamizawa lied about where they were from and have it kept that way since. In that case, it's a dead end, but it's my duty as a cop to keep trying. There's enough circumstantial evidence to say that the great Hinamizawa disaster wasn't a natural one. If I could grab a hold of one piece of concrete proof, I think I could start reeling in the truth behind all of this. Yeah, but it's been over 20 years. The truth might be lying somewhere very deep in the darkness. That's true. I might not find any answers. It's already the 21st century. What happened in Hanamizawa in June 1983? The only factual evidence that I had was that Mio Takano mysteriously died and left her scrapbook predicting a bioterrorist attack. A young girl took a school hostage to make people listen to this prediction, but no one took it seriously. The chief doctor at the village clinic committed suicide. People believed that a little girl, Rika Farood, was a reincarnation of a Yashiro Silent and she was brutally murdered. What was the truth behind the scrapbook? Was it written to reveal a huge conspiracy? Or was it just a bunch of delusions written by an occult maniac? If the contents of the scrapbook were true, the disaster could have been avoided if we had heeded the warnings of one girl. If they weren't true, then who created the disaster to follow the scenario of the scrapbook? After the Sarn nerf gas incident, the words mind control came into the spotlight. In contrast to brainwashing, which can easily force a person to commit certain acts in the short term, mind control takes a long time to gradually make a person believe that what he or she must do is the right thing to do and to act upon it as if it were his or her own idea. It's a form of character alteration, which is far more serious than brainwashing. The cult behind the Sarn gas incident induced fear and anxiety into the members through its revelations of doomsday. At the same time, they ordered them to do certain things as a means of salvation and had them to do so voluntarily. The formula was quite similar to how Reina Ryugu became a puppet of file number 34. So does that mean that Reina Ryugu was mind controlled by someone? Does that mean that the cult that mind controlled her tried to cause the end of the world in order to increase the credibility of their teachings, just like the other cult did? Would that make file number 34 some sort of religious, religious textbook for them? When I lose my grip on what's true and what's not, it sometimes makes me feel that someone might be laughing in amusement at this disaster. This scrapbook was like a script. It was a script for a tragedy that takes the lives of thousands of villagers one night. It was a script for demons who laughed at that loss of human life. Someone ripped the script. Someone performed it. Someone watched the show and laughed. Damn it. What the hell happened to Hinamizawa in June 1983? Well then. It ends just like that. <laughs> that was a long tip, not gonna lie. But it, it, gee, I wonder what really happened. Well, anyway, it's almost 30 minutes, but I'll just wrap it up for here. So, like, comment, subscribe, and next part. I say this was supposed to be the last part, but the the very very last part will be the bonus part. So, see you then. A few moments later. Welcome back to some more Tsumi Haraboshi, aka uh, recording the very last bonus part to wrap up this series. So, from where we last left off, we did read in through the entire tip, which is called a demon script. Apparently, I guess what happened was. Even though the 6th chapter ended off on a very good note, 
it still caused the disaster anyway, which is pretty unfortunate. I was like, wait a minute. I thought, I thought this is a very good ending to leave off, but I guess not. So that's what happened within those uh, 29 minutes worth of reading. Uh, let's see, chapter jump. Yeah, there's a lot of this stuff. Um, let's jump to a uh, staff room. Let's see what this is going on about. Hello, my name is Ryukishi07. I hope you enjoyed playing Higarashi When They Cry Ho, oh, Chapter 6, The Sumihara Boshi. Well, I indeed enjoyed it, despite having the series placed on hiatus, but it was pretty good. There are several themes I wanted to write in this chapter, but I'd like to talk about one of them here. It's about the denial of murder. This is something I had to write sooner or later, since this is a novel about serial murders. There are two means that youngsters in particular use these days to solve problems, which are suicide and murder, or mur or you can just say murder and suicide, but either way. When we feel stress, we choose to either get rid of the source of the stress or to get away from it. Let's say you're bullied by a kid at school. You have two ways to solve the problem. You choose either to get rid of the kid from your current environment or to get away from the environment itself. See? The, the, uh, the creator <laughs> does know the, the occasion. Holy shit. This guy is... This is, this is two ways to within the situation. Oh, man. Usually bullies are stronger and have their underlings, so you don't stand a chance alone to get rid of them. It's also not easy to switch classes or to quit school, so you can't easily get away from the situation. As a result, the situation gets worse day by day, and your stress urges you to solve the problem immediately. And you come up with murder or suicide as easy solutions. If suicide is considered defeat, you'd want to consider murder. I feel like... Yeah, I've... That sounds like the kind of scenario that everyone would probably discuss over. I feel like there are many people who think that way. However, if you actually committed a murder, it wouldn't be easy to pay for the sin. I believe murderers know that well too. Not all of them. But you really hate the bully who pushed you to the limit where you have no choice but to kill him. So, with a determination that turns your entire life upside down, you commit murder. But if you have such strong determination, there have to be more ways to take than opting for murder, which should be the last result resort. You can talk to your friends. If that doesn't work, you can talk to your family. If that doesn't work, you can talk to your teacher. If that doesn't work, then what? There have to be more ways. If you have the determination to give up on your life by committing murder, there have to be more ways. Our modern era is better than any era before it. There are many hotlines that you can call to talk to someone. Even if you don't have any friends or family, there are many places you can go for help. The people who will answer the phone aren't amateurs. They're volunteers, but they're also veterans who have worked as social workers or juvenile counselors for a long time. I can assure you that they have more social experience and passion than your parents do. People who work to help people for free can't be bad people. If you feel like you have no choice but to kill the bully or commit suicide, please try to call those hotlines. People who think it's useless to talk to others usually haven't really talked to anyone. Have the courage to call. There will be somebody you can completely rely on at the other end of the line. Don't keep it to yourself. Talk to somebody. Ryukishi07 wrote such a long story just to tell you this. He must be a very poor writer. <laughs> poor writer. So, Ryukishi07 wants to talk to you all rather than worrying all by himself. How can I write even more entertaining stories? Bitter laugh. 07 Expansion Ryukishi 07 Hmm. And then just, just like that.
Yeah, I thought this bone... Okay, so I guess the tips was like half an hour worth of reading and then the stat room was like this, so... I guess I could just, you know, mer merge that all together. But, uh, yeah, it was... So basically what happened in the stat room is like, it gives you like a little word of advice as to um, if you're bullied or getting abused in a situation like that, rather than going through the vigilante type of way, like ask an adult for help or call the hotline, all that, that's basically what it summarizes within Especially within those Hirashi chapter themes and stories where it's all about killing each other and all that all whatnot. This is what happens when you read this, the tip, the bonus tip from the sixth chapter and whatnot. Anyway, that'll be it for the entire series. So... There, I have um, comments telling me to play Umineko and whatnot, so stay tuned for that read-through. Y'all have a good rest of the day.